good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are listening from. We are continuing this week on uh, the experience that happened at, at Pentecost. Last week I gave you a rather hurried background uh, to the uh, coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. We discussed uh, that it was a historical experience, that it's unlimited in scope, that it's unchanging in matter, that it results are always the same. Jesus is glorified, sinners are converted, and the invitation is still the same, and there's still a needy world that needs spirit-filled men and women. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter uh, 5, verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So we want to talk this week about uh, what does this experience mean for you and what does it mean for me. So stay, stay with us and we'll try to find out what the answer to that question is. Get on, 
on, bored little children, get on, bored little children, get on, bored little children, there's room for many more, get on, bored little children, get on, bored little children, get on, bored little children, there's room for many more, get on,
a couple of scriptures to you here. I think these kind of fit in with what I want to talk about today. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4. Isaiah wrote, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath I seen, O God, beside thee, what he has prepared for him that waiteth for him. Now Paul quoted this scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for him, that those that love him. But I want you to notice here what Paul added to that scripture after he said it. We're talking about uh, the baptism of the, Holy, of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah said, Eyes not seen, ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared. And then 800 years later, Paul quotes this scripture, but adds this, But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. And here's uh, something that I found interesting that another writer wrote. The gift of the Holy Spirit is therefore a foretaste of the fullness of life which the Christian will one day live in the presence of God. A foretaste of the very life of God himself and a pledge and a guarantee that someday God will fulfill his promise and enable the Christian to enter into that life. He who is in the Spirit, therefore, in him is the very life of God. You may say, no way, no way. You mean to tell me that the life of God is going to be in me? Well, listen to what Jesus had, Jesus had to say in John chapter 14, verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. So, what's in it for you and me? It's the Holy Spirit coming to live within us. And Jesus said, even I and my Father will come and be with you. So I think what's in it for us is what we really need in order to mature spiritually. Now remember, the early church needed no convincing. The baptism on the Holy Spirit was, I call it SSOP, not just standard operating procedure, procedure, but spiritual standard operating procedure. People were saved, and then they were filled with the Spirit. It was that simple. So we find associated with the teaching on the Holy Spirit such words as power, guidance, love, righteousness, peace, joy, and then also uh, in Romans, the 8th chapter, the Bible says the Holy Spirit intercedes for us when we pray. He searches our hearts. He convicts us when we do wrong. So isn't, isn't this what we want today? Is this something that we would like to experience in our lives? I think many are starving spiritually while they're quibbling about the way in which God has endued the church with power for service. There's an interesting comment in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Peter wrote, Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Now that word, uh, words unlearned and unstable mean untaught and unestablished. And the word rest means you, you twist and you distort. So here were people, they hadn't been studying their Bible. They may have been reading it, but they didn't study it. They didn't uh, really look into it to see what does this really say. And sometimes you make uh, quick 
decisions, and you later find on, found out that uh, that wasn't such a smart decision. So many are guilty of twisting and misinterpreting God's word in order to make it fit what they believe, and they lose out on great power and spiritual blessing. This places a great responsibility upon us as stewards of the full gospel. We should seek for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And then after God fills us, we should ask him for wisdom as we allow the Holy Spirit to move in us and through us. Now the Corinthian church had misused and abused this experience. It became necessary for Paul to write to this church and instruct them on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Most of Paul's admonitions for this church, and I think it's also for us today, is found in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. Paul was far the manifestation, the manifestation of the Spirit in the congregation. He said, follow after charity and, and desire spiritual gifts. But then he also said, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, uh, that was where that scripture was. Then also in 14, 12, Paul said, even so, for as much as you're zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. You love the gifts, you love to see them manifested in the church, but when you have the manifestation of the gifts in the church, see that the church is edified through those manifestations. And you're not just enjoying uh, the manifestations yourself. God wants a church that is filled with the Holy Spirit and that is walking in the Spirit. So what is this experience for us? Let's go back to something that we've already mentioned, those things, words that we uh, associated with teachings on the Holy Spirit. Let's look at some of these things. So let's start with what Jesus started with. Power, Luke 24, 49. You will receive, tarry till you receive power. In Acts 1, 8, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Luke 24, 449, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with that power from on high. Then Acts 1.8, but you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then after you receive that power, you are going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. So the emphasis here is upon having added ability to do something. These disciples, they've been saved. They've been walking and with the Lord for three years. But Jesus said, you, uh, you need just a little more power. Look, look back at the disciples before Pentecost. You remember uh, around the time of the crucifixion, that one verse says, and they all forsook him and fled. And Peter denied him uh, there. And then later on, even after the resurrection, they were locked in this room for fear of the Jews until Jesus appeared and said, Peace be unto, unto you. So we find uh, the Holy Spirit is an additive to our life. It's something that God wants to give us to help us. Uh, I think one way to maybe explain it a little, I remember one of my professors in Bible college uh, he, was, he had been a mission, a Presbyterian minister and a missionary in, I think it was India. And uh, God saved him and filled him with the Spirit. And he, when he was teaching on the book of Acts, he, he would just lean across his desk and kind of pound the desk. And he said, the baptism of the Spirit makes the things of God real to you. So it, it's an additive. Some of you, some of you may remember uh, commercial products. Uh, when they added something that was supposed to make it better, we had uh, toothpaste. It had GL70 in it. Some of your older uh, saints maybe remember this. Shave cream had K34. Cleanser had superchlorine. Gas had Platformate. 
and oil was super permalude. Uh, everything looked pretty much the same, but now the additive did something to the problem that made it better and more powerful than it had been before. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. It, it, it gives us something that makes us better and more powerful and, and helps us in uh, uh, so many different ways. In uh, Acts chapter 18, we see Apollos coming on the scene. The Bible says uh, in Acts 18 verse 24, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. He was really good yeah. at ministry. But it says, uh, he was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the spirit. He sp spoke and taught diligently the things of the Lord, but he only knew the baptism of John. And then right after that, it says he, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And Aquila and Priscilla, a couple that uh, had been helping Paul out in his ministry, they heard him and they took him aside. And the Bible says they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And there are several commentaries believe that they told him, you know, there's more for you. You can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because look on down to verse 28, and it said, after they had talked to him, this says, then he mightily convinced the Jews and publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Something got added to Apollos' ministry that showed out in his later preaching. But then right in the next chapter, we find uh, Paul going down to Ephesus, and it says he found certain disciples, and he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, We don't, haven't even heard of for what such a thing as the Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Well, what were you baptized? And he, they said, Oh, under John's baptism. So Paul baptized them in water, and then the Bible says, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and the men were about twelve. So, we have these two incidents here that show us that Pentecost makes a difference. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Tarry until you receive power. Power to live for God. Power to witness for Christ. Power to endure, endure persecution. And if necessary, power to die for our testimony. Then there was the word guidance. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. John 16 and 13. When Joseph and Mary took Jesus to the temple... The Holy Spirit led Simeon and Anna to be there at the same time to speak their prophetic word over the baby Jesus. In Acts 16, Paul said the Holy Spirit, we see that the Holy Spirit would not let them minister in Asia or Bithynia. And while they were just waiting, well, what are we going to do then if we can't preach in Asia or Bithynia? So while they were waiting, Paul got the vision of the man in Macedonia that said, come over and help us. And immediately they left and had a wonderful ministry. Uh, and some think that was when the gospel was first introduced uh, to Europe. Then there was the word teacher, John 14, 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Then on the uh, negative side, if you go under persecution, and when they bring you into the synagogues and under magistrates and powers, take no thought how or what you shall answer or what you shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. So the Holy Spirit was sent to help you in the good times and help you in the bad times. Then there was the word love, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience, patience, experience, experience, hope, and hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. 
that is given unto us. And then go to Galatians, it fits right in with this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. And the first thing we mention there is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Then there's prayer. Jude chapter 20, chapter 20, Jude only has one chapter. Jude verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And some feel that that is praying in the Spirit and allowing the Spirit to pray through us. 1 Corinthians 14, 14, 25, 14, 15, Paul said, what is, then, what is it then? I'll pray in the flesh, but I'll also pray in the Spirit. And then the one we quote most often, Romans 20, 8, 26, and 27, likewise also the Spirit helps our infirmities. How does he do that? For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Have you ever been to that place? where you were praying and, and you get to a point and it just seemed like uh, it wouldn't come out like you wanted it to come out, but it says the Spirit begins to make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And there are, again, those that think that that is the Holy Spirit praying in the Spirit because it says he searches the hearts, he knows what's the mind of the Spirit because he, he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And you know as a uh, as you're praying and you allow the Holy Spirit to take over and the Holy Spirit begins to pray and you feel the burden lifting and, and you feel like the Holy Spirit knows what I, what I wanted to pray and he, he's, he's, he's praying that prayer for me and you just begin to praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit's ministry in that way. The Holy Spirit is a wonderful helper in our prayer lives. And again, Romans 14 and verse 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was sent not just on the day of Pentecost, because later on we see Paul giving three whole chapters uh, of guidance on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was sent to abide with us forever, John 14. Verses 15 to 18. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, because he dwells with you, and he's going to be in you on the day of Pentecost. I'll not leave you comfortless. I will come to you in the person of the Holy Spirit. So the need for spirit-filled men and women today is greater than it's ever been in history. Jesus said the harvest is truly is plenty, but the laborers are few. Pray, pray that the Lord will send forth laborers into the harvest. It may be the local harvest, it may be the foreign harvest, if the Holy Spirit does the leading, he will lead you where he wants you to be. Jesus said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So, in conclusion, let us pray that God will make us hungry. Let us pray that God will make us thirsty. Let us pray and prepare ourselves for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray for another Pentecost. Father, we do make that prayer even right now. We pray for another Pentecost. We pray for another outpouring of the Spirit. We pray, Lord, that, that you will begin to minister in these last days, just like you did after the day of Pentecost. We pray, Lord, that People will feel your presence. They will begin to pray and to seek you, Lord. They'll begin to pre preach your word. They'll begin to witness for you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name that you 
Christians everywhere will allow the Holy Spirit to begin working in them and through them. Lord, those that are unsaved, oh, Father, may they, may they give their hearts to you and learn the blessing of what it is to be filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. Lord, make it real, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for The Chapel Hour with Rev. Russell Weishart and the Weishart Family Singers. For previous programs, please go to YouTube and search for The Weishart Family Singers Channel. If you're a minister, teacher, or student of the Bible and would like to access Rev. Weishart's messages, outlines, and sermon notes, please go to thechapelhour.blogspot.com. And of course, one of the best ways to stay in touch with us is on the Weishart Family Singers Facebook page. We want to thank everyone for finding us, for your encouragement, for subscribing to our channel, and for hitting that little like button. We look forward to seeing you next week on The Chapel Hour.